Hi, everyone. Can you hear us? Yes. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Good. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit of a close run thing. It's exactly 11 o'clock. If they took <laughs> our heart reading now, it would be spiking like you wouldn't believe. Forget the COVID. <laughs> Right, so thank you everyone for joining <laughs> us. We were, Charles and I were originally planning to do this outside with true COVID, you know, safety and all that. But um, as you can notice, we're not outside. We've got, we've got the doors open, which is our source. We've got of, the bells tolling for all us. All right, and they're going to finish bells. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, I'm just... I'm, I'm in charge. Unfortunately, Diane's not here today and she'd normally do the technology. So if I keep moving forward, it's because I've got to do some things on Zoom. So, Charles, do you want to sort of set the, set the tone for today? Well, I will I'll just say good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you, actually. Um, and I hope you can hear us and I hope we make it through to the end without something going drastically wrong or horribly wrong. Um, but the link between um, and Halford has actually never been resolved. Do you know that? It's yeah, no, well, absolutely. And that's still why. down. The, the, the official debate <coughs> was done, um, I think, I don't know if it was in the Savile Club, but it's certainly uh, mm. the fly fishers. It was never conclusive as whether it was in good practice to have nymph fishing on chalk streams or not. Um, and the weird thing is that that still perpetuates today. It still goes on. I mean, it's the most odd thing that we still haven't come to terms with the fact that trout's diet comprises of pretty much subsurface things rather than floating things. Whether we like it or not, that is the reality. Yeah, no, it's very true. So it's, it's always just down to a question of niceties and ethics. And Really, <coughs> two, two great men, um, very different in their outlooks, um, very different in the way they perceive life, um, and very different in the way they analyzed what they did. And um, it, it's an extraordinary story of cultural divide, I think. And oh, that's I mean, the yeah, right yeah. thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is very, this is very much the sort of Brexit the debate of its time and it, i mean it, it's still it got nasty too it did get very it did get very nasty as we're explaining so i think what so what we're going to do we sort of aim to let you all get get to your lunch about noon so charles is going to give a sort of his overview of skews to get us started uh, and then i'm going to give an overview of uh, of of halford and then we'll chat, and then Charles and I chat a bit backwards and forwards. Some of you very kindly sent in some actually really good questions and some stuff I'd never even thought to discuss. And we'll run through those. And we're going to aim to finish about, uh, about, about 12 o'clock. Um, we're going to record this. So if you want to uh, send it on to someone, you can. And we're probably going to try and set up an online poll to see whether you're a Halford man or a Skews man. Right, I'm going to open this by saying I'm not necessarily certain whether I'd actually want to fish with skews. Now, that's a very, very robust thing to say <laughs> right off the bat. If you look at any, any of his photographs, he is the stiffest, most unrelenting character you'll ever wish to find. And I like to think that if, as somebody that paints occasionally, if you look at someone, you analyse them, and here was a man that was absolutely driven. Now, whether he was driven because he was a Wickhamist, I don't know. He was, yeah. I mean, I mean, he, I mean, I'm sure you're going to come. But he was actually banned from the Abbott Spartan syndicate because he just insisted on catching so many fish. Well, you know, that says more about it than I ever could, actually. <laughs> I mean, but, so, <clears throat> be that as it may, I mean, if you look at what was going on at the time, you had a gentlemanly pursuit, and it was a gentlemanly pursuit, irrespective of what's happened to it. Now it was a gentlemanly pursuit. Um, and it, here was this man, this lawyer, who'd come up, he started fishing the River Lee, di da di da di dong and he found a way. And what the, the popular myth, Simon, mm -hmm. of all this, and, and 
I, I suspect there's going to be a lot more authorities on here than us, actually. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Um, but the, the popular myth that's grown up around skews is the fact that he invented nymph fishing. That's absolute tosh. I'll say it here and now, it is nonsense. <laughs> what skews did was bring together elements of fishing the spiders of the north, shove a thoracic blob in it, look at what was happening on his rivers in the south and say okay this is what i shall do basically if you analyze his flies and i've looked at them every which way i've mm -hmm. tied them you know the, the late terry griffiths was wonderful at depicting a, a, a yeah so excuse me there's a freudian slip <laughs> um, now if you analyze those they couldn't have sunk that far they were basically emergers they were damned. They were moist, dry flies, in effect. But he knew by analyzing, and this was the thing about, about the man, about Skews, is that he analyzed. As a, mm -hmm. as a, as a lawyer, he, he was driven and was practiced in the art of looking beyond the actual instance. So by looking at it, he probably found that the surface movement of a trout, be it at Abbott's Barton or indeed anywhere else, was probably made by something fish feeding subsurface as opposed in the surface. Whereas Halford was completely doctrinated, indoctrinated to seeing things in 1D, whereas Skews saw it in 3D. He did, did he? yeah. I, I, and I'm that's the big, big difference. In my, in my very humble opinion, and it is a humble opinion. I was dragged through the um, water meadows of Abbott's Barton whilst, you know, sort of, come along, son, we're going to do it. And it was my dad who was doing the posthumous illustrations um, for Skew's book, Itching Memories, which is just a collection of his writings. But I remember going through those um, meadows and my father depicting, you know, the places where Skew's fish, did only go so I, I came to him at a very early age, um, but I always loved The Floating Fly by Halford. And this is where I've got a foot in both camps because I love fishing the dry fly. But I know, and we probably, everyone on this call knows that given if you needed to catch a fish, yeah. would you pin your hopes on a dry fly? I'd use sweet corn. <laughs> well, the idea is maggot and sandwiched between a bit of flake, but be that as it may, it's, it's, have you found it just flies off when you cast? Yeah, I know, it's, it's too so anyway, But, you know, if we wanted to go out and we just, we straddle the Wallop Brook here, uh, as I chat to you, and it's running clear and beautiful, but I know full well that if I wanted to catch a fish from it, I'd probably put on a little shrimp boom and then get down to it, and that brings in soil. You know, that Freudian slip that I made a little while ago, it brings in soil. So there we have it. We have a great man with an enormous legacy. I brought up a quote, and it's from John Goddard um, in the essential GEM, GEM skews list. And it says, I still look on skews with considerable awe, as without doubt, the greatest thinking fly fisher ever to put pen to paper. In this respect, he was way ahead of Halford as an observant and creative angler. And I think that's a nice way to hand over to my wonderful colleague. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, they were, I think, without a doubt, I think there were quite a lot of similar characteristics to Skews and Halford. In fact, in that they were both obsessives. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Um, though I think, um, I think, think with retrospect, uh, Halford is generally regarded as more doctrinaire, but I think the truth is Skews is, was probably. Um, but just to give you a little background, in the same way that Charles said that um, Skews didn't invent fly fishing, sorry, didn't invent nymph fishing, nor did Halford invent dry fly fishing. I mean, he was a wealthy industrialist, came from the Midlands, um, a sort of unlikely sort of person you, you might expect to, to come south and, and, and get involved in chalk stream fishing. And his first port of call actually was on the Kennet, was where he had, he had a syndicate there. And most of his early 
experimentations with dry fly fishing um, were on the Kennet. But eventually he decided in about, I think it was about 1880, he abandoned the Kennet because he felt the fish didn't rise enough, which possibly says something. It's John Arthur on the Kennet. It is a bit, but there we go. And, and that's when he re relocated to Mottisfont Abbey on the test. But he was, I mean, you know, at that time, there were lots of people using dry flies. I mean, for instance, um, there's a club up on the Haddon Hall estate on the Lathkill, which predates predates Halford, and they've had a dry fly rule there, I think, for over 200 years. Do you That's remember? Roger Woolley, I think. Is it? I can't mm. remember which it's club it is. So, Someone out there will know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the point. So he, but what he did, he he didn't invent it. He more codified dry fly fishing, and set it down in two books, and it essentially became a craze. I think that's the best way to describe it. People discovered it was just a fantastically exciting way to catch fish, and it was different. And um, he laid it out. You know, you could buy his book, and you could follow the, his steps. To create the perfect, um, to create the perfect dry fly, and you could then go fishing. Um, I'm not entirely sure Halford would have been the greatest fun fisherman to, um, to the greatest guy to go fishing with. Um, if you read his books and just you know talk around it, it seems that he actually really didn't do that much fishing, and his idea of the perfect day would be to go out, find four fish that were rising, tie on four different patterns, having precisely identified which, what the fish were rising to. Because the thing about Halford was, you could not cast until you had identified the fish. So there was no point putting on a blue winged olive unless you saw the fish take a blue winged olive. He was that obsessive about it. So his idea was find four fish, find four different insects that they were rising to on each occasion, and then have four casts and catch four fish. That was absolutely his perfect day. I, now this, it actually, if you think about, if you analyze that, it, it sums up all sorts of things. One, um, you're talking about an absolute obsessive and you know you're talking about two obsessives I mean yeah. but in a slightly different way um, you're talking about two people with great intellect yes I think that's very true yeah um, you're talking about people of a slightly different character whereas I mean <laughs> um, Skews had a really waspish sense of humor mm. and he and he was Halford was no intellectual match for him I don't think mm -hmm. um, he would win a debate well he didn't win the debate actually but the other thing we mustn't forget in all this, and it, it, it's germane to everything, Simon, mm -hmm. is the fact that the hatches that they had in those days were absolutely vast compared with today. So what we're talking about was a very valid thing for, for Halford to do, mm -hmm. and he chose to do it in that way, in the way that we sometimes select how we want to catch fish now. Um, he would do it in the same way, but he had the opportunity to have four different rising fish to mm -hmm. four different hatching patterns. Well, and of course he has the time. I mean, the thing is yeah. what we all forget today is that, you know, we or most of us just have a chance to go out maybe one or two days a week or one or two days a month or maybe even one or two days a season. Whereas people like Halford and Skews to the same extent would come down for months on end and, uh, and rent a house and, you know, they had the opportunity to go fishing every day. And if the fish weren't rising, they simply didn't go fishing. But how much? I'm going to throw a slight spanner in your Halfordian works here. I'm not, I'm not, okay, oh dear, um, oh dear. And that is how much of a role did uh, George Selwyn Marriott play in the, in the mystique of Halford? I think he played a lot. I mean, but, but the, thing about, the thing about Marriott was, I mean, he could have, I mean, it's unarguable that he was the intellectual powerhouse yeah. behind what Halford did. But the point is Marriott didn't garner the publicity and the status that Halford. Yeah, he was yeah. quite a shy man. Yeah, so, well, so anyone wearing a hat like that would be. <laughs> <you know? laughs> 
<laughs> yes, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't pass Just for these. those of you who don't know, he used to have this rather quaint um, tongue of shanter that sort of dropped down. It sort of started here and locked down to his, his shoulder. And um, how you fished with something, I've no idea. Anyway, yeah, but so, 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 I mean, yeah, so I think it's fair and it's often said that Halford, you know, followed in, the, really followed in the footsteps yeah. of Marriott. But the fact was, you know, it was Halford who wrote the books, it was Halford who, you know, created this whole wave of stuff. And you, you could go into fishing tackle shops and you could buy, you know, Halford branded flies and Halford branded lines and all that sort of thing. So he's quite a little celebrity. Um, though it has to be said, he was a pro fisher of his day. He was, and, you know, and then not like he needed the money. I mean, he <laughs> was he was immensely wealthy. And uh, I mean, uh, but of course, the, the slight irony of Halford is he died in 1914, just before the outbreak of the First World War. He was, incidentally, if you want to know, he was on the he was on the Mediterranean cruise to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, he died. Yeah, I think he died. Of, I can't remember. It might have been. Um, uh, some, some, I can't remember we done, but anyway, but the point was, it was actually he was he was actually well. We seem to think that there is a good chance that he and Skews had met on a few occasions. Oh, I think so. Yeah, uh, and there doesn't seem to be any personal an animosity between them. The animosity between dry fly and nymph fishing actually came a long time after 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 Halford's death and there's actually his disciples were probably more radical they were a bit more that's always the way isn't it they were, they were a bit more Taliban about yeah. it than he was I'm just going to say that word Tal I think we can can't oh, we right. okay. <laughs> it's not what you can't say but I think it's one you can say so but I think your point is and that quote there that's very interesting is that you know Halford Halford was definitely was not as observant and uh, as Skews. I think I think it. I think he just took and codified stuff. Whereas how? Well, whereas Skews was actually trying to take take us somewhere I, new. I think you know we've got to look. I mean, <laughs> dear old Skews lived a long time. He died. He's born in 1858 and died in um, 1949. So oh, right, I didn't know he was that. No, old, he was pretty old. So um, he would have seen a lot of things. He would have seen a lot of ways in which the sport had changed. Um, but I think all of us that fly fish, especially in the South, have both made a huge legacy. You know, yes. they, they've laid a foundation of which we can either agree or disagree on, but he, they laid that foundation. And I think that must be you know, overlooked or diminished. And, and I think the other interesting thing is, you know, who has had the greater impact on fly fishing, Halford or Skews? Oh, crikey. You know what? Globally, I would say Halford. You see, I would probably, I would, I would, I would think, I would say intellectually how Halford has had the bigger impact. You know, we all aspire to catch fish, or at least uh, uh, this is my personal opinion. Most of us aspire to catch fish on a dry fly because it's just more exciting. If you ask, Simon, if you ask any American, you know, and I'm sorry to take this globally, folks, but that's what we're going to do. Um, if we take this globally, and you, oh, bless you, he's trying to shut me up. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to give you a... But, but if we go to an American, yeah, and you, and they'll have an understanding of... I'll call my wife in from the other room. Yeah, no, do, like, please. <laughs> no, 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 do. Um, but if you ask that person, you know, where... Would they fish in England? Chances are it would be the test. Yeah, or the itching. Um, or the itching, mm -hmm. but probably the test yep. would be the first one. Ask them what would be the preferred choice of, of design to fish on that river. It probably would be a dry fly. Yes. And how did that come about through the branch and through Halford? Yes, yes, exactly. And of course, the other thing about Americans and the river test, of course, Eisenhower was famously pictured fishing on the test yeah. in the preparation for the D-Day landing yeah. and it was and it, and a whole it generation. To to. And that, that's in many ways perpetuated the whole thing, I think. And that's why I believe that the dry fly would have preeminence over the nymph for that very reason. Well, you see, but where I'm slightly disagreeing with you is the fact that... Which is good. And yeah, <laughs> in the kindest possible way, my learned friend, <laughs> is that... I, th I think so. I think, as I said earlier, intellectually, I think Halford 
has a march on skews. But in, pra in a practical fishing sense, I think skews is, has had far more influence because I would posit, and I'm happy to argue this art number, but I'm just going to pluck it out of the air. I'd say that for every 20 fish caught on a nymph, there's one caught on a dry fly globally. Oh, look, you're talking to somebody that has got no, absolutely no conscience when it comes to fly fishing, <laughs> apart from not breaking a rule. But, you know, the thing is, I, I know that, but there's still that most people still hunger for that dimple rise on the surface that says you fooled a trout. Most people still do. Oh, I, look, I agree with you. I mean, there's a dry... romanticism about the dry fly that just isn't. I mean, I, I, I entirely agree with you. I mean, look, dry fly fishing for me is the, is, is the crack cocaine of fly fishing. Oh, I, I love mean, that. But, but whereas basically nymph is just, you know, a bit of skunk. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's just, you know, it's, sorry. Sure. You might need a lexicon <laughs> to understand any of this. But, you know, so that, but, but that I, 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 so I think he's, I think, so yeah, I think Skews his legacy is, is probably the bigger one but it, it, in a slightly different way. Yeah, I, I, I'd hope, yeah, I don't know, I'm trying to argue for skews here. For skews, <laughs> but you're trying to skew. And it, so I thought, um, where are we? We're about halfway through, so I thought we'd probably... We really ought to let them have a go at us. Um, well, I tell you what, we'll do the questions first. Shall we? Oh, right, we'll, right. We'll the yeah, questions. yeah, no, do, do, do. So this was, I, I've got this. Oh, uh, that's lovely. I'm, I'm going to let you show it to everyone. Right, are you ready for this? Can you all see this? There it is. Need it just a little bit higher. <laughs> there we are. And that was emblazoned on. Can everyone see that one? I hope so. Um, it was emblazoned on a t shirt, wasn't it? Yes, I'm not quite. I, mean, I don't, I'm trying to understand it. Skews shucks. Are they saying, is this a pun on chuck or is it yes. because skews shuck? Uh, no, skew no, 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 sucks. No, no, no. no, <laughs> no. Shuck, as in nymphal shuck, yeah. as in. It close to a dry fly, so skews shucks. He's subsurface, and the dry fly comes out. Oh, so it. it oh God! I yeah, I, I must admit, I did. I, I, I couldn't understand. Anyway, that that apparently was on the T-shirt given to uh, Simon Kidd of Snowby yeah. for guiding the New Zealand team in the 2000. They well, haven't got any morals trip. either. <laughs> Sorry, out there, New Zealand land. I know you well. I, I mean that. Actually, I have to remember my. My, I've only been to New Zealand once and you'll always hear it said that you know go to New Zealand it's the most amazing fishing in the world there's nothing like it sadly it's absolutely true I mean it was yeah it was one of the was one of the most amazing one weeks fishing I've had in my entire life and um, but I do remember my huge shock as you know we'd gone out into the back of beyond just me and this guide and we'd seen this fish nymphing. I mean, you don't catch very many fish on the dry fly. I'm Unless sure. it's a mouse. Unless it's a mouse. Now, there you are, you see? You, that's not no, that's not a fly, you see. It's a mammal. <laughs> it's a lure. <laughs> so you can... Yeah, it's imitative fishing. Well, that's very true. Well, I mean, uh, for those of you who don't know it, the biggest fly, bigger, sorry, the biggest brown trout ever caught on the river test was caught on a trotted mouse. Was it? Yes, yes. So, uh, was um, was it was trotting. It, it, well, <laughs> well, so, so, I mean, just, 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 just yeah, well, not quite. It was actually dead. So the mouse was dead. So at how to mill, um, when it was a working mill way back when, um, there used to be this huge trout that lived at the bottom of the mill race. Right. And from time to time, mice that were scurrying backwards and forwards used to fall into Brilliant. the mill race oh, and this it. trout used to just lie there sit there and wait for one mouse to come down every couple of weeks apparently they're very very um, um they've got a lot of calories a mouse apparently yeah no i mean it's a bit of a, it's a big I didn't protein. know that but apparently they do have well they were, I mean, if you're a child and so anyway so some of the, one of the miller one day found a dead mouse yeah. put a hook through it and trotted it down through the mill race and caught the fish and i believe it's stuffed in the houghton cup and how heavy I think it's about 16 pounds. <laughs> we're, we're truly so wild. They, see what I mean about the calories? <laughs> anyway, anyway, but I was just saying my biggest shock was in New Zealand. So I'm in the back of beyond and he says, oh, I'm going to try this fly. Have you ever seen it? He brings out a pheasant tail nymph. Oh, no. Well, I've heard that in America. <laughs> I was just like I'm that. trying that. And you were unbelievable. But there we go. So anyway, we, we've, we've done... Is this the, a quiz? 
No, it's not. No, it's not a quiz. I'm just bringing out the questions that people have sent in. Right. So this is um, from a from a from a member of this parish, um, Alan Middleton, ex chairman of the uh, Fly Dressers Guild, an yep. ex fishing braids guy. Uh, I have a few thoughts on the Halford versus Skews debate, but I should be working, so I'm not going to join in. He says he's never worked in his <laughs> life. <laughs> He, fishing with a dry fly is so much easier than fishing with a nymph. The skill level required to fish a nymph successfully is far greater than fishing a dry fly. With a dry fly, you see it all happen in front of your eyes. With a nymph, you need to be able to ascertain where the nymph is, where the fish is, and when the fish takes the nymph, all of which um, takes place some two feet below the surface in a swift, more, in a swift moving stream. I mean, I don't think you can argue with that. No, you can't. But you could argue on, on behalf of, of Skews because his flies, the way they were tied, there is absolutely no way on this planet would those flies descend to two feet below a, a moving surface. Ah, interesting. So no you, way. So you think he was, you think he was between 18 think, inches and the surface? I would have said he was even 18 inches. I mean, coming you, back to your point. You cannot... You, it, I don't know how many of you out there have ever looked or tied a, a, a skews nymph, but if you look at a soft tackle, if you look at any of the, of the northern wet flies, they were designed to be fished upstream. Everyone's got this quaint idea that you cast them across and let them swing round. Well, yes, you can do that. But the, the ultimate design was that they were meant to be cast upstream to visibly feeding fish. And they were to represent cripples, mm -hmm. Or emerges, and all, all Skews did was put a thoracic blob on there. That was it. It couldn't have sunk much further, unless he was doing something like putting lead shot. And he did experiment with rubber bands. Really? Yeah. He wow. did. I mean, he was way ahead of his time. I reckon he. I don't think he'd be using blobs. Well, on he, on on. Let me let me but, so let me ask let however, me ask, let me ask this question from James Wishart. Okay. Because it sort of brings on to that. What do you think Halford and Skews would make of the use of emerger patterns like the clink hammer or duck stunt on chalk streams? Ditto heavily weighted nymphs and bead heads. Well, I certainly with, with Skews, he would have used them. I mean, it, it, what people forget is they, they're so, I suppose, hidebound to this thought that Skews did nothing else but use nymphs. But You've got the little brown sedge. You've got all sorts of things. He 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 was fascinated with the blue winged olive and came up with the orange quill and realised that there was a difference between red and orange at the time of day because of the ambient light. I mean, he was a thinking man. He he, you know, if there was a fish merrily rising the spinner, he wasn't going to put a nymph on. He would use a, a proper imitation of that fly. And this is where you know history can paint people in a very specific light mm -hmm. and that's where they get boxed neatly and as we know life is seldom neat and true, true. as i'm finding out <laughs> so do you think so do you think he'd have used a bead head yes okay uh, and a heavily weighted them yes okay what do we reckon about halford do we think he'd no <laughs> Yeah, I think we're all agreed on that one. I don't think. Yes, he. I, I mean, as I said, I think I said earlier, he become he became very doctrinaire. And he wouldn't even look. So he probably wouldn't have even used foam. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. Well, he had his. He had. He had his book, and that was. I'd know. like to think he would have used CDC though. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. So let's um, let's have a look. Um, um, just for those of you who um, want to research more of this, you probably know of just the two best books were written by um, one person, yeah. Tony Hayter, um, uh, who sadly died, for those of you who don't know, he sadly died uh, in, on the 17th of November yeah. uh, of this year. And so he wrote, um, he wrote GM Skews, The Man and the Nymph. Um, you can get that, uh, it's available. All these are on Amazon. Uh, just a complete, it's just the perfect biography. It's favorite, favorite organization. Amazon, I love Amazon. <laughs> and of course, the other one, um, the one that really started this all for us today. There's a copy in there. FM sure. Halford and the Dry. Oh, yes, we have yeah, a, we got Char a Charlie, Charles's magic box. Uh, FM, there we have Charles. Yeah, there, we go. there it is. That's the one. 
Yeah, and do get it. It's it's fascinating. I managed to pick this up very five quid. I managed to get that for. Oh, you bargain! You bargain! 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 So, um, and that hut. Look, it's just fallen over. That hut's still there. It is. So show that to us. Yeah. This hut is still. It's still down. Well, it's on, a, well, I have it's, a, it's, a, it's on. It's a, it's a. It's a. I have to. I have to it's say. On your horses, it's a fishing break speed at Motter's so Abbey. That, this is a, a horrible. <laughs> And, and wicked way of getting you to pay money to Simon to go and see this hut. Well, I, I, no, I would, I would, I would just say it, it is. I mean, it, it's actually in the ownership of the National Trust these days, and that, that, that what, whatever you might say about the National Trust and all the trouble they've got themselves in, they do make a beautiful job of looking after it. Oh, it's perfection. And it? uh, and if you want to come and see, if you actually want to come and see the hut. Um, I'm doing a river walk in June and July, which will actually take in the hut and you'll have a chance to go inside. And actually Halford, towards the end of his life, I think he got a bit bored with fly fishing. So he was an earlier, early adopter of colour photography. So if you go into the hut, there's some amazing photographs he took of uh, Mottis Font, of things that go on. There's um, there, there's some great pictures he had of the village celebrations with Queen Victoria. Was it her golden jubilee? Yeah. I can't remember. But more interestingly, there are some amazing pictures of the fish he caught um, and, and the river. And you'll often hear people talk about chalk streams and say, oh, they're not like they were you know, 100 years ago. Well, go and look at these photographs and you'll see the river is absolutely identical. You'd be hard pushed. I've actually done it. I've actually taken a picture. I've, I've done a facsimile with my camera from the same perspective of Halford on some of the beats. And you'd be hard pushed to tell really? the difference. It's I mean, the other, <coughs> excuse me. The other thing, too, that, you know, we've been talking about Halford and, and um, Merritt. But you've got to also throw into the equation of, of Skews. His great chunk was um, Barton. Oh, yeah. Right. And Barton was, you know, he used to write poetry. He was mm. an absolutely fabulous photographer. Yeah. There's an awful lot of his work around. So if you ever get a chance to see some of Barton's work, it's, it's a really wonderful tableau of its time. It really is. Anyway, excellent. So actually, there's a question here from one C. Jardine. Was it? Would Skews have Chet nymphed? Oh, Skews definitely would. <laughs> You know, but I, I think, it, you know, he would have embraced um, all sorts of things. I know he's just thrown those on the, no, no, on the just, floor. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for the next question because we've um, got plenty here. Dismissive sort of a way <laughs> right there. Um, but, yeah, he, he um, I think he, w I, he would have been very open to what was going on. He would have loved, I think, um, the actual classic French nymph thing where you spot a fish, very long leader, very tiny weighted fly, just dropped it little bit ahead of it to to cause as least disturbance as you possibly can and um yeah he would have embraced all these whereas i think that um i think halford would have stuck to his dry fly guns a bit he was i did definitely get the impression well the fact that he stopped fishing yeah yeah i told me everything yes actually. he was yes he you know for him it was all about you know and it's actually quite interesting if you go if you go to Mottis Fon, he um, created this rather lovely garden around the fishing hut, which he used to. Well, that's good. You know, right? Well, I just got to prune the roses. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's in, and, and the garden is the garden has been lovingly recreated by the National Trust for well, the nice. So yeah. <laughs> So that's what he used to do. Right? So, uh, and they actually, and they actually had right behind the fishing hut. They had a fishing stew there, which where they used to grow their own trout on. There I'm, you go. I'm keeping up. So there you go. Here. So we have an interesting. This this one's here. So this is. I'm going to. So this is from Paul Windle Taylor. Thank you, Paul. And this is um, on the subject of Halford and Skews. I'm now reading the Hayes and Stasis Cat ebook. E Trout and flies getting closer. They suggest that Halford's dry flies may look good on land, but don't float. They wallow like an emerger due to overdressing. Uh, and the book in the he quotes the book here. Um, so one expected result of this new insight into the success a century ago of Halford's book is that the supposed pinnacle of our sport is actually based on a fallacy. Ironically, the, for the dry fly purists, their fully hackled flies have never been purely dry. 
but to pierce the surface representing emergers and casualties rather than the hatch fly. Had they succeeded in imitating the fully hatched dun ready to fly away in an instance, they would have deceived many fewer trout into a take. Right, I'm going to take them to task on this. Oh, well. <laughs> um, I'm going to spring to, very unusually, I'm going to spring to Halford's defence because what they've overlooked is the style in which he was fishing them. Okay. And they've overlooked the fact that, you know, whilst there, there was a Halford dry fly rod, he was using, and if you look at some of the old pictures, oh, okay. incredibly long rods that actually looked as though they were dapping. Right. So those flies were actually intended to dance on the surface as opposed to sink through it. Yes. And if you look at the flies and if you look at the way in which the wing configuration is done um, and the way in which the hackles are woven through and also the configuration of the hook um, and, and Marriott will have come up, you know, he um, with Hall came up with the first eyed hook and you know what? I think they've got it wrong. Okay. That's I really do. Good. I'm sorry, Don. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, um, everyone connected with that book. And I did the cover, for goodness sake. Oh, gosh. Don's just left, the, le just left the Zoom call. Uh, oh, you lost another friend. No, 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 no he wouldn't. Because uh, Don would have come at me and he would have explained that. I know that. Um, and so would Peter. Yeah. You know, Peter loves a great argument. And very often, you put stuff in a book just to be argumentative. And, and, you know, like a wonderful, naive brown trout, I'm the first one to come up and nab that thing off the surface, <laughs> let me tell you. But, it, yeah, if you look at the, you've got to, don't just look at the actual thing, look at the whole. Yeah. And that's the thing about a painting. You, you've got some fabulous art here. If you took it on its own, you probably would go, oh, yeah. if you actually come back and look at it as the whole, it becomes something else entirely. And that's how we should, we should it, look at our fish. And I would also add to that, we actually mustn't forget how bloody difficult fishing was back then. Yeah, you know, the equipment wasn't very good. The banks weren't trimmed and manicured like they are today. You know, you didn't, you know, if, if it rained, your feet were wet. Yeah, you know, it was really, it was, it was quite an and, arduous activity. And how first was, you know, I'm, I'm going on about this, with, 10 foot longer. So they would have been dancing on the surface. They didn't have, you know, a progressive tapered fly line or a, a tapered leader. You know, they, they didn't. They didn't have any of that stuff. No, I mean, that, that, and, the, and, the, 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 and the banks were very, very wilderness -y. Yeah, so, and the casting, I mean, he, he used to have all sorts of sort of strange Galway casts and things that went up and around. Well, and, yeah, well you couldn't, you know, you couldn't go backwards and forwards and backwards no. and forwards because 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 you know you were fishing with far more delicate tackle it couldn't absolutely. take the punishment and, and, and i'm sure i'm absolutely certain in my own mind that they lost an awful lot of fish i'm sure they did but you see dear old um what what's what skews did he didn't bother about going to english manufacturers he went straight across to america went to hiram leonard and co got the wbr the world's best rod boom I and did not know that. Nine foot, and uh, I fished with it, and I was given one that was an absolute facsimile mm -hmm. from that period, the same one. And I wanted to, I was, I was left it in a will, and um, I wanted to catch a fish on the test and on the itching, just so it was nice and equal, then I was going to retire it, which I managed to do. And it was the most hateful experience <laughs> of my entire <laughs> life. It was like casting with, you know, you know that taglatelia that comes out, it just drips. Yeah. It was like that. It was horrible. I know people often say to me, oh, aren't you going to go fishing with a split cane rod? Oh, and, and, I, and I say, I will go f f fishing with a split cane rod when Roger Federer wins Wimbledon with a wooden tennis racket. <laughs> I think he probably does. Yeah. He's very good. So there's a good question here, which sort of segues on to what we were just saying. And then we'll just, after this, we'll throw it all open. And if anyone wants to shout out a question, we'd love to hear it. In those days, I assume Halford would have fished the dry fly with a silk line. How would that line compare to today's <laughs> modern equivalent? Would a silk line still be superior for presentation even today? Thank you, Richard, for the question. I think originally it would have been plaited horsehair. Um, and tapered at that, I think. And then it would have evolved into uh, silk. Uh, the, the Spanish still 
prefer when they're fishing for really small dry fly feeding fish on their mountain streams and other places where they're very nervous, they'll still opt for a silk line for its presentation. Mm. Uh, yeah, I've, I've and used, the French too. I've used a silk line. I, it, it, it does. I, as I say, I can sort of come back to my Roger Federer analogy. I, you know, it, it has its uses. It's no stretch. You grease it properly. It's okay. It floats nicely. It does cut through wind quite well. It does, it's and it does actually. Weight. It does it, and it does actually turn over quite well. But I wouldn't fancy using one all day, every day. <sighs> you know, it's the distances that we're talking about. I think it makes very much difference. I mean, there's that lovely that. It, if you look at a silk line, it's given rise to so many things. I mean, that was a game changer. You know, there's always game changers and things. You had double tapers. And I don't think I, uh, there's going to be someone out there that will be able to tell me about this. But I don't think there was ever created a weight forward. Um, well, there might be modern times, but a weight forward silk line. There might be, but I don't know. But the, um, the fact that double taper is wonderful because it was done out of, uh, you know, basically being prudent you, yeah. you use one end and you didn't have the memory so you could turn it around and use the other end yeah. and the, there's a lovely story some of you will have heard the term oval casting you know Hans Gebet's Reuter where the line goes underneath the rod tip and over the rod tip and that that sort of oh the thing we do Teut every day yeah, yeah. Teutonic oh. right um but um well it was Austrian actually um uh, but um the it came about purely because of the um, Gebetz Reuter was a keeper mm -hmm. on, or river river manager yeah. in Austria, and he used to look after Ritz and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. It was his job to actually dry the lines, the silk lines, between uh, okay. lunch so they could use them again in the afternoon. So they're all drinking their you know very expensive <laughs> wines that Ritz would bring yeah. along. And there he was, and he couldn't be bothered to keep marching them out backwards yeah, and forwards. Yeah. So he developed this cast that just shocked everyone because he went right, boom, out it would go, and he started double hauling and putting it out. That's how it all started. Oh, there, we there you go, as my old uncle would say. What my uncle would say? Yeah, I don't know. You could learn something new every day, really, even from a book. Thank you. That's <laughs> nice. <isn't> it? <laughs> See what I have to do with this. <laughs> so one last question, um, and this is, and I'm going to ask you this, this is because you've got your Angling, Charles Scott is angling against pollution t shirts. Angling against pollution t shirts. Yep. Sweatshirt, there it is. There we go. And it just to, so um, Tim Smart, thank you for this. Um, most of us are delighted to support the campaigns against pollution, which are supported by the Angling Trust, Simon and Fergal Sharkey, but too many of us leave, leave discarded tippet, leader, and other rubbish. How can we encourage better behaviour by all those who use our rivers and lakes? Well, it wouldn't have happened with them because they were using gut, which would break down, I suppose. <laughs> That's um, true. But I think, I think a more top, on the more top I of... think, well, I, I'm going to flagrantly um, summon up something I do, which is fishing for schools. Um, and it starts with educating the young. And you've got to do it in a way that they understand it and they they need to buy into you can't just say well it's not good to do give people a reason why it isn't good to do yes so um we all know on this call why we should be doing it but there's got to be greater access to devices that help us store our nylon in the moment i saw one and someone very proudly showed it to me said oh look at this this is from getting discarded tippet i went oh that's lovely yes he said it only cost me 45 <laughs> I went, what you know, and this is this is for bringing in waste material. Then I saw an old-fashioned pot, you know, like an old film capsule with a, with a lid with a cross in it yeah. that people stuff that in. Well, carrying something like that can make a real difference. Well, I mean, I I, I have a special container in most of my jackets. It's called a pop kit. Yeah, just but the trouble is, I get all stuff mixed up. So I'd rather have a receptacle I can pop it in. But you know, if waistcoats were made with a little cavity here. Yeah. That you actually had a little rubberized pocket or yeah. something, you know, like that, and got it in and just discarded at the end of the day. How how good would that be? Yeah, I'm, I must admit, I don't. I mean, I spend probably more time than most on rivers walking up and down. And I I, I would say certainly, uh, you know, I don't see that much disc. I don't see much detritus from anglers. Uh, really. I do. 
where yeah I, yeah I mean I'm fishing quite a lot of still waters I do all right well I and, um, defer to your you know it, it is is so depressing I don't think there's one one fishery I've been to where I haven't gone into a car park and picked up a, a, an awful amount of discarded nylon yeah okay well I stand great as I say yeah. well no you wouldn't hear because people have probably got far better uh, conservation credentials and ideas but you go to an an or and, and if you go to a fishery like um, Letchlade and you see hanging in the trees just you don't need Christmas up there it's already hanging in the trees come autumn um, <laughs> That's true. you know and it sees trailing strands of nylon and goodness knows what and it really is quite depressing actually yeah I mean I will I will say I will will but we plead guilty we do have trees on some of our beats that yeah. are, I think they eventually die of metal fatigue they have so many hooks in them so well I think we've covered well, pretty well I, everything we're going to unmute can you hear me all now so if anyone wants to shout out a question please do yes just go on for can you hear me yep we can hear you sorry yeah just going back to the discard of nylon and what you were saying about fishery car parks perhaps a fishery should take the responsibility in providing bins like there are dog food poo bins uh, ar around to encourage uh, uh, people to uh, dispose of them. Just the nylon. Can I come in? At, and actually, it's a very good point, but then we've got to take responsibility ourselves. They shouldn't be dropping yeah, in yeah. the first place. Um, but the, the other thing I would say is there's a number of fisheries. Manningford is one. Uh, the one at Sportfish is another, where they've actually got receptacles around the lake at various oh, okay. points where you can actually put your nylon in. Is it you? Not as much as it should be, frankly, because you still see the island in the car parks, and there's yeah. no excuse. Anglers are their own worst enemy. Um, they always have been, they always will be, and we need to educate them far more. It's getting better, but we really do need to start taking a bit. Yeah. Um, uh, I suppose <laughs> something for our actions. I mean, we, we've, we've got, to, got to be responsible. Really. It's funny what, what you were saying about the um, you being shown something that cost £45 because uh, I think uh, I purchased something similar, but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe not quite as much as that from Rob Jens, but anyway. Um, well, you know what, as soon as you go into um, Alistair's, you know, which we call Robber Jens, by the way. Um, I Rob <laughs> Um, you know, you just. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand up. Stand up I'm for him. Why up, don't you? I worked in there. I'm going to stand up for him. No, it's, 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 it's brilliant. When I come down from Cambridge to, to fish at Whirlwell, which I'll be doing again this season, I, I always make a point of going in there first thing, and, and it's a real joy. But maybe the nylon manufacturers should should uh, uh, pick up the gauntlet and, and, and well, maybe when, provide a, some sort of. Um, Free device that they could stick their logo on. Uh, I, I, you know, um, I think that's yeah. a really good point, and maybe something that one should look at to sponsor. Because you know, I'd love to see it happen. You know, I, I really would. But there is an organisation now that is taking in waste, bulk fly lines and nylon. I've forgotten the name of what it is, but it is a, a receptacle where you actually can go in and. and you can collect it, you can drop it off at a, a fishing tackle. There's a great big, you know, a place where you yeah. can drop it. Um, so pe people are becoming more aware and people are doing things. But, you know, is it too much, too late, uh, too little, too late? I don't know. I do. I mean, the, um, I'm not a great one for um, health warnings, but I, I mean, we don't actually write anything on the spool of nylon as far as I'm aware, do we? No. Maybe this could injure wildlife. Maybe, maybe that. Maybe I don't know. But yeah. who, you know, if you've got a committed smoker amongst you, and there's the most lurid things apparently on the back of cigarette packets, do they take any notice? No, probably so, not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, anyone else like to shout out the question? What about ledge shot in the rivers? Ledge? Did you, Richard? Did you ask what about lead shot in the river? Well, yeah, because you know, of course, fishermen got all this bad press. For leaving lead shot in the rivers, but what about the shooting community? They oh, never mentioned. Okay. Well, that, I mean, I I think this is going to stray way off from where we intended to be. But yeah, okay. to answer that a little bit, I mean, as soon as 
a bank, as soon as a question came about, the Anglican community stopped using a lid shot and, and um, sought alternatives, which became very quickly and freely available. Um, I think the shooting community is getting its act together far more. Um, I think there's bismuth, there's a whole bunch of things. I'm not, I don't shoot, so I'm the worst person in the world to answer this. But um, Well, I can jump in to say okay. that if you're, if you're wildfowling, you're not allowed to use lead, and that's been the case for many years. Yeah. So um, there, 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 there was recently um, an attempt by, or someone, uh, the government, to uh, in fact ban lead altogether, but the shooting community fought back against it, and so that won't happen. Um, so at least as far as anyone shooting over a river, the rule is that you should be using um, uh, bismuth. So, uh, that, that, I hope that answers your question, Richard. Yeah, I, I think it's not been properly sort of considered because the amount of lead shot, you know, one cartridge is far more than a fisherman would lose in a whole season. And I think also you've got to take into consideration too that many of the re res um, the responses and the areas of, of scientific research were conducted on the Thames and they didn't actually look at the lead coming out of the petrol going into the craft <laughs> that were popping up and down. So I think with this you've always got I think if you do stuff and you make sure you do, you'll get your house in order as much as you can, as anglers have, then you give people very little wriggle room. Yeah, and I, and I think to your point, Richard, essentially, we just, if someone accuses us of being, you know, being responsible for the death of a lot of wildfowl, I think we just have to fight back with precisely your argument and, and Charles's argument. And also point out that most of the fish in the Thames are high as a kite because it's got the highest density proportion of cocaine in it of any river in Europe. <laughs> Is that what, why it's called wild swimming? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, God. Oh, shut up. Yeah, 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 a, 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 anyone else like to jump in? We'll probably take. Yeah, I've got a quick question and going back on, on seamers. What, what would um, Halford and, and Skews think of uh, grayling fishing? I mean, we've, that, it's the that, rise over the last 15 years has been fantastic, but... Um... Oh, that's a really good question, and I don't know. Oh, I, 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 undoubtedly, they would have loathed them. I mean, yeah. grayling were considered a pest. Um, you know, I've I was reading something about... I mean, I can actually remember, I mean, this seems hard to believe now, but when I started fishing breaks 30 odd years ago, the I mean, the, the Environment Agency used to come along to the headwaters of the test, electrofish, and take all the grayling out, and then go and put them in Romsey Memorial Pond in the park, much to the delight of all the local kids. Um, so, you know, and that was 30 years ago, and that was a legislative body that was doing that. But yes, no, grading were undoubtedly a pest. People killed them all. Uh, they would not have fished them. They would consider them beneath them, and they'd have been very annoyed. But the interesting thing, Carl, is that still perpetuates today in America. Because you can go out and you can fish the Madison or anywhere in Colorado, thereabouts, and catch these fantastic things called whitefish. Now you, you know, I love catching whitefish. I mean, they're grayling without a whacking great dorsal, and they fight really well. And they take a beehead, and they're, they're amazing. Um, whiteies, whiteies. You say this to an American guy, and he goes into apoplexy. I mean, he really does. And then he tries to beat you about the head with his rod and reel. Look, I, I'm with, look, I'm with the guys. I've, I've been I uh, think uh, in, brilliant. I, 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 Having competed in the Jackson Hole One Fly more times than I can know, the frustration of having pulled whitey after whitey after whitey yes. while I was meant to be catching brown trout, brook trout, or rainbow trout. No, I'm not <laughs> accepting this. Well, I think they're just great. So it's a sports anyway. I'm not going to win, am I? Really? No, no, no. Actually, and here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a small and interesting factoid about grayling. Grayling used to be, New Zealand rivers used to be entirely full of grayling and there weren't any trout at all. And all the grayling were, was, were killed, died in probably what was in a volcanic eruption. Really? Yeah, that did something to all the rivers in New Zealand and wiped the entire grayling population out. And so every, 
every trout you see in the New Zealand River is the product of stocking. Quite good stocking. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, but they've all gone wild. So, yeah. but there we go. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. So, if someone would like to shout out, and then we'll say. Can I? Um, Tim Smart. Can... Hi, Tim. Uh, hi, uh, Mr. Ogden, who uh, I learnt about when I went fishing with Andy Buckley on the Derbyshire Y. Yeah. Um, didn't he have a uh, a rather significant? Uh, role to play in dry fly fishing. Well, uh, we never talk about him down here. No, we don't. And Tim, I did mention it um, when we were talking about about Halford, that, you know, Halford is accredited with so many of, of inventions, what have you, but Roger, Roger Woolley and, and a, a number of others um, could, is widely thought to be actually instrumental in the use of, of dry fly. I mean, and if you look at, at, at cotton, I mean, that, I mean, it, all right, it was probably dapping, but it was still dry fly fishing. So, you know, you can go right the way back to, you know, um, mm. year dot. So um, you can actually say Derbyshire was probably the crucible of, of dry fly fishing in many mm. respects. Yeah, definitely. I mean, coming back to my, that point I made earlier about Haddon Hall and the dry fly rule yeah. massively predating. So, yeah, Tim, I think it's a very fair point. But, of course, history is always unfair <laughs> so, yeah, there are plenty of people you know who will ever really remember the man who invented the internet tim berners lee will all always remember you know facebook and google but I, and what my question to you simon is this how has the river test which is created yeah um it isn't a, a river as the Y is, or, or, or the Derwent, or anything else. Yeah. How has that become the preeminent river in the world? <laughs> good question. It's a good question. I, I mean, I, I, I think to a certain extent, you know, these things perpetuate that themselves. That from someone that fishes the frome, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, I, and, and I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to bang the drum for the test, but I will say that I have noticed over the years the peaks and troughs on other chalk streams are much higher. So you have really good days and really bad days. And it goes like, it's far more jagged. Whereas on the test, it's a far more wavy curve, if you like. So you're saying it's easier? I see, I'm just saying it's, I, I, I'm saying, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Sorry, I'm just stirring. <laughs> you, 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 you don't get quite as many incredibly dour days no. as you can. And I, I think that, I think that's part of it. And of course it's been, you know, a, just from, from, from accident of geography and history, it has been, you know, protected and looked after mm. far more than most other rivers. So uh, I think that has something to do with it. But the interesting thing is the itching is, it, it hasn't got nearly the same, I, I was going to say notoriety, but I won't. Um, sort of preeminence as the test, and yet it is far. You know, it's got this, all the same qualities. Yes, but it's got all the pluses too. It's a, it's a fascinating river, the Itchen, and there speaks someone who actually wants their ashes scattered on the Itchen. Oh dear! Oh, yeah. Well, I will remember that in case no one else does. Well, I'm hoping. <laughs> 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 That's a, no, you know, on that note, <laughs> it's goodbye from me. Yeah. <laughs> and well, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed thank it. Thank you. Um, uh, have you all, all have a very happy Christmas? And um, we'll, we'll, we're going to do this again. We hope find a new topic. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this format. I mean, it's lovely to see people rather than be talking to the ether. It really is. And. All of us are contactable via Twitter or, or any other devices. So please do get back to us with any questions or any, any thoughts, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Be wonderful. Uh, yeah. I think you should do some more meetings. What was that, Jess? Sorry, I think you should do more Zoom meetings with different topics. Okay, we'll, we'll try and make it a monthly event and we'll try and work out what to do next time. Oh, I know exactly as, what we can do next time. As, yes. as, a, as a bloody foreigner, it would be nice to discuss uh, wild versus stocked fish on occasion.
Oh, <laughs> I, I know. I know. Charles, Charles, and I have had that discussion some fifteen oh, or twenty I'll years ago. But... Blades and get ready for public, public uh, I, ritual. I, I, yeah, but, yeah, but I, I've been I've been down that the road before, so I'm not all that anxious about it. But um, that would be a really good. And I don't know if any of you are members of the Piscatorial Society, but you'll notice in the late, latest edition, I've been taken to task for my support of stocking. Well, you know what? I, I, and I'm going to ride into my colleague's rescue because I was fishing at um, Grafham uh, last, last week and we were fishing off the shore for the killer shrimp feeding fish. Essentially dry fly or just subsurface. Mm -hmm. uh, Skews would have loved it. <laughs> um, and I caught a fish of about three, three and three quarters. It could have been, and it was as solid as a steel head, and it had bloom running through its tail. The tail was complete, every fin was intact, and it looked like looking at mother of pearl along the whole of the flank. It was a stock fish yeah. at some point. Yeah, I know that down here in the south of Sweden, fly fishing would be virtually non-existent if it wouldn't be for, for stock fish, whereas up north it's a completely different thing. I mean, fishing for sea ram browns in the sea is a big thing here, but otherwise it's basically stock well, fish well, most of it. Well, we'll take that on board, I can see. Yeah, it, it, I, d I dare you over the Christmas. I dare you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fantastic. We dare. We dare. So everyone, bye bye. Very, very have a Christmas, happy, have a Christmas, mate. Everything Thank you. you that you Bless want. You. See you Bye. next time. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.